Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, at this session, What's New and Cool in Azure Synapse Analytics? We hope you enjoy the SQL Beats. And if you, have, if you have just joined the event, have fun. It's Saturday, free time. So uh, spend some time with community, and learn new stuff, and discuss your current problems. My name is Paweł Podasiński. I'm a senior program manager on the Azure Synapse Analytics team. Uh, I'm assisted by my AI-based uh, Stan GPT assistant. He'll be doing demos for me, hopefully. Um, Formerly known as Clippy. Uh, yeah, Clippy. <laughs> uh, as you can see, uh, it's another build of Stan. Uh, you can see that on his, uh, uh, on by, by his LinkedIn profile, it's, it has build number in it, so let's mm -hmm. go. The purpose of this session is to make sure that you are aware of what's new in Synapse in the la latest six, eight months. Uh, so we'll be covering pretty much a lot of stuff. Uh, the assumption is that you know what Azure Synapse Analytics is. So if you're not familiar with Synapse, just for sure, it's an end-to-end -end analytical solution or platform uh, that is uh, presented by Microsoft as PaaS service in Azure. And you can do pretty much a lot if, in terms of analytics. Uh, so you can start with ingestion of data, then transforming the data, doing some exploration and data engineering stuff, ending up with data serving and machine learning. OK. Before we start, there is a single source of uh, Layer of, of, of knowledge for you if you want to if you want to keep up with Synapse, aka.ms slash Synapse monthly update. You don't have to write it down. We will have another slide at the end of this presentation with QR code, so we will just take take the shot, and you'll have the all the links that you that you that you will need for learning Synapse. But we encourage you to uh, track this down uh, on a monthly basis. So we took the last six eight months. And we do a kind of synthesis of that, but uh, the the real the real um, the real goal is to show you also the direction uh, in which product is heading. So you probably know that Synapse is develop is being developed uh, in several areas or workloads. So we'll go through the workloads one by one. It's covering covering data integration, engineering, warehousing, and lake housing data science. Observational analytics, business intelligence, and governance, pretty much everything that is related to analytics. So we'll cover six, uh, six areas mentioned previously, um, again, one by one, to, just to make sure that you know uh, what's the direction and what are the latest features. So let's start with data integration. Um, the basic assumption of data integration um, do not read the slide. <laughs> we try to provide you with the slide later on, but uh, it's just for the purpose of you see how many features we release uh, on, a, on, a, you know, on, a monthly, on a monthly basis. So the direction here is, first of all, make sure that you're able to ingest the data from practically any source. So we have over 100 connectors uh, in a, I would say, well-known environment, uh, pretty much uh, similar. Not the same, but very, very similar to, a, to Azure Data Factory. Um, second direction, we want to make sure that uh, your data ingestion and transformation can be uh, provided in a secure manner. So whenever you have to keep your environment isolated, uh, the data integration should be, should be actually uh, aligned to this requirement. And the third actually uh, is based on the assumption that it's not only about data engineers, but also about some low-code people who may want to ra rather drag and drop than write the code and perform some complex data pipelines. So with that, let's, let's switch to the first feature we want to show. Uh, it's time to live uh, with managed virtual networks. So uh, data integration is based on things called integration runtimes. Basically, it's a kind of compute power that you can uh, get to uh, to make your pipelines working. Um, challenge was previously the challenge was that whenever you created integration runtime with, uh, with within virtual managed virtual network, so in a secure manner, you were you were you had no you had no chance to to limit the time that uh, activities spent in queues. So right now with time to leave. Uh, 
can, that can be defined for a new, in newly created integration runtime, you're able to define how, for how much time uh, the, the, the compute power provisions for activity will stay, stay alive. So the next activity can, can reuse the same compute power, and QE is, well, it's, it, it takes less, less time, basically. So, um, hey, uh, st stand GPT, please run a demo for me. Thank you. Okay, Pavel, here's an example of a demo of running a copy data task with a managed, for, in a managed virtual network with TTNL enabled. So, um, who here has used uh, Azure Synapse Pipelines? Do you have the managed VNet version? How much do you like the queuing? Yeah, indeed. So this solves it, this solves it. I, for the first one, you still have queuing, but all latter ones will go a lot, a lot faster. So just to show you how you set it up, I, I've set up a few different integration runtimes. I'll focus on the T, uh, oh, TTL, TLL, I, I made a typo there. Uh, SQL bits, and if you click on through that and you look at virtual network, advanced, you can see that it has computes, copy compute scale enabled. So basically any copy task that will ex execute on this integration runtime will you reuse that compute that was created for five minutes. So if you have multiple tasks running in a for each loop, that will do the first one you get queuing, the second one will keep going, keep going without any queue time. Now, just to show you what the difference is on that part, so how much faster can you get with this? So I've got this thing here, so what I've done, just drag this down. So I have, basically, I'm getting metadata, which is a normal operation, which is just, uh, and I'm looping files with a copy with TTL, and I'm doing the same with the auto-resolve integration runtime without the TTL enabled. Now, um, if we go and look at the actual execution times of this, you can see that for the non, so the copy TTL, here we go. So the non-TTL copy is 56 seconds, the copy TTL one minute and eight, the first ones, because we have that queue time. However, the second one for non-TTL copy takes one minute and 37, so it still again has that queue time, while this one doesn't have the queue time anymore. It automatically spins up and automatically starts executing, which goes a lot faster. So we reduce the queue time, queue time is gone for those five, nim five minutes. If the five minutes are gone, the compute is gone, which means that you still you get that queue time again. Um, also note that there's a bit of a cost um, related to that as well. So. Uh one best practice for those of you who are not uh, who are not working with Synapse a lot, uh, do not you, you don't have to uh, to rely on the uh, default integration runtime. You can create your own with a fully full blown setup, including TTL. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Let's go further. Um, I mentioned that connectivity is one of the priorities in uh, data integration. So there you go. SAP Change Data Capture Connector is one of the, I would say, most significant improvements uh, last time we had in, in both Azure Data Factory and Synapse Pipelines. So first of all, uh, why it's important? Well, because SAP is quite everywhere in, in enterprises, right? So you see uh, old-fashioned ECC, you see, uh, you see SAP, SAP for HANA, BW, BW for HANA. So everything has, this connector supports pretty much pretty much everything you, you may meet in the SAP or its SAP landscape. How it works? It's not based on any poor man's solution based on uh, time on, on some timestamps. It rather uses built-in CDC uh, mechanism in SAP. So you use the I would say I would say SAP uh, SAP corresponding service to Dataverse in in uh, in DT65 to pump the, to pump the delta changes from SAP uh, to Synapse. It's actually based on the mapping data flows, so the connectivity is, uh, is and the, the, whole, the whole pipeline is, is being done by using mapping data flows. We're not gonna show you the demos. If you wanna see the demos on, of this feature, go to either Azure Data Factory YouTube channel or, um, or, or probably there is also an example of that in the blog of Azure Data Factory, so you can easily find this, um, yeah. I also showed the demo of that at the latest Data Toboggan. The recording is available uh, on the Data Toboggan's uh, YouTube channel. Okay, enough of data integration. Let's focus on data engineering. So here, we have a couple of priorities. So first of all, uh, keep in mind, Microsoft love, loves open source, for real. So we try to keep up with open source investments. Apache Spark to be the number one, number one among those. Uh, so 
We invest a lot to, to have the newest versions of uh, Apache Spark supported in Synapse Spark Runtime, and it's, and it's one. Um, I would say the second one is about uh, making sure that we support uh, the most popular uh, prog programming languages, R is a great example, and that we provide uh, best, best uh, experience for developers when it comes to notebooks. So, long awaited feature, <laughs> R language support. Um, probably this could land in data science, but we thought it would be great to show that, hey, you can, you can do your data engineering using R. So what you can do, you can switch to R language in your notebooks and use external libraries imported to, to Synapse, uh, Synapse Spark uh, runtime uh, to play with uh, R for machine learning purposes or data engineering. The demo would be boring because it's just another language, so if, you use, if you're using R, uh, try, try, it, try it out and maybe, maybe you will migrate your solutions uh, to Synapse, uh, Synapse Spark. Um, the more, the more important, I think, is uh, this. Spark 3.3 has been uh, recently enabled, generally available. Uh, it brings several improvements for us as data engineers. Uh, yes, Stan GPT is always, is, is always engineering something. Um, Delta is, is, the, is the, most, the most significant improvement. We moved from version 1.2, that was previously available or supported by Spark 3.2 to version 2.1 with significant improvements that we will show you in a second. Um, but also, you can spot several improvements that come out of the box when you switch to runtime 3.3. Uh, those improvements are, for example, um, uh, faster executions of, uh, of smaller queries, and also uh, there is uh, better ANSI, ANSI SQL uh, compatibility. Actually, you can force full compatibility with ANSI SQL. There are also, there are also some uh, improvements when it comes to uh, pandas, so koalas comes into the game. Um, so hey, how about finding uh, some new features in Spark 3.3 in Synapse? Uh, Stan GPT, please proceed. Okay, here's an example of new features in Spark 3.3 for Azure Synapse. Now, one of the long-awaited features for me when I was working with uh, Synapse Spark was time travel. Who here uses Spark? Who uses Delta tables? How was the experience before time travel? A bit more clunky, but now it's really, really good. So uh, I'm just going to show you that it works. And uh, for people that don't know what time travel is, I'll just explain what it is. So let's say I have like this, this fact sales table. And I'm just selecting some data from it. You can see I've got some sales ID, some passengers, sales amount, vendor ID, so like a lot of details here. And let's say I wanna, I'm, I'm not a very good employee. Um, the numbers are not that good, so I'm going to inflate my sales. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, all my sales amount, I'll just set them to 1.10% so more. Boss is happy. I am happy. Nobody knows, OK? I thought nobody knew. He's never complained about his salary. <laughs> It's not a complaint, it's the GPT one. <laughs> anyway, so you see, I, I update that, those values to get numbers of row affected, but then I can go, so suddenly somebody checks my work, and he says like, oh, describe history of that table. And we see like, huh, what happened over here? Somebody did an update against this table. So we created it, we had an update, a restore, I'll show you that in a little bit, and another update, so somebody is playing around with that table. Now, can we go and check what that table looked like before? Yes, you can. So you can basically say, show me the current version. So this is the current version where we have that inflated sales. But if I then would go and say, hey, uh, give me the original version of the data, which is version zero here. You can also play with timestamp and all those things, but version zero is basically showing you, give me the original version of the da this data before any of the updates. It shows me, hmm, these sales are a lot different, which basically means I get caught by doing those updates to those sales. But well, let's say, you, who has never done an update statement and it was like, ah, the work loss? I have done that. <laughs> who does the backups? <laughs> <laughs> so then it's backup restoring and all that stuff. Not with Delta. With Delta, you can just say, hey, restore that table to this specific version and it automatically restores that table and you start back from that clean version. Pretty cool, isn't it? Yes. yes. Now, another one of the cool features, I think, is optimizing Z order. Um, does anybody know what the optimize command is? A few of you do? 
Some of you don't, I see. So optimize, basically, if you are creating and updating and inserting uh, with Delta tables, Delta tables uh, basically have a uh, load of parquet files with some JSON above it. And the more you insert, update, and delete, the more fragmented your, your table gets. You get all these little small files, which are intertwined, which take longer and longer and longer to query because you've got all these lists of files. Now, optimize command basically says, hey, optimize this data. So it will take all those files, push them into larger files, about 500 megabytes to about one, two gigabytes, which basically means that you have to read less files and you get more performance out of them. Now, another cool thing is, do you have indexes on files? No, you do now, sort of an index. It's called, if I go over here, Z order indexing. And Z order basically means structure the data inside those files based upon, for example, pickup date. Now, normally your first strategy when you're doing um, optimizations for your delta tables is you're going to use partitioning. Now, this is an extra layer of performance enhancements you can take by just doing optimize C order by, and you will structure the data inside those files. Any, any SQL Server developers in the room? One, two. Have you been, have you been using uh, um, ordered cluster col columns? Ordered indexes? cluster columns three indexes? It's that. Sort of, almost. Now, I did this for a specific table, so I have the three different versions, and I executed some queries against it, just to show you what the difference is. It's the same query for all of it. This is the optimized one. I only read 160 megabytes of data. The original one, I read 1.2 gigabytes of data, and then the one where I just did the optimized command without the order also already helps a lot. And this is with serverless SQL pools. Who knows how you pay serverless SQL pools? Anyone? For a sticker? For two stickers. Two stickers, two stickers. Per terabyte of data? Yeah, per terabyte of uh, data. Uh, important, read, written, or processed. Huh? Yeah. Which one? Read, written, or processed? Yeah, yes. Processed. That's a winner. Red? That's, yeah, one, exactly. that's one sticker. That's one. That's one. Processed. <laughs> Keep in mind, processed. You can see written, read, and moved data. And the sum of it is the, the amount of money you pay. So doing that C order indexing already reduces the amount of data that you're reading, which means you reduce the cost. Now, you might say th this, this command might take some time to execute, but very good is that you can also do this on a specific partition or a portion of your data, so you don't have to touch all of that data. You can just say, hey, take this on the last partition. So that was a demo on the Spark.3.3 uh, runtime. Thank you. Okay, just to tell you the truth, uh, we run from time to time optimized with Z order on his data, so that's, that makes him responding so fast. <clears throat> okay, let's move to the next part, which is pretty much, pretty much hot, data warehousing. Who's running warehouses? Uh, with Microsoft? <laughs> <laughs> A few. Uh, oh, that's not that bad. <laughs> okay, so hey, uh, data warehousing, uh, here, here are a couple of priorities. So first of all, uh, you probably know that it, warehousing is not just about warehousing. We do, we do lake housing right nowadays. I'd say even more. Um, so we have two SQL, two SQL runtimes, serverless SQL. Stan was actually referring about uh, serverless SQL. So the, the one that does not require any uh, compute clusters, it just, it just exists and runs queries. The second is dedicated SQL pools, which is pretty much old-fashioned SQL data warehouse with some improvements. And it's for migrations of uh, you know, existing appliances, for example. So the direction is this. For serverless SQL, we want to make sure that it reads more and more open source formats, like Delta. So Delta improvements in serverless SQL, that's the direction. Another direction, well, we were not the best in the CICD, <laughs> CICD experience, so uh, providing this is is the goal as well. And for dedicated SQL pool, we wanna, we wanna make sure that if you wanna migrate from pretty much anything that exists and is significant the data warehouse uh, on the market, like Netiza, Teradata, you're able to do so without some dirty workarounds. So compatibility with those existing warehouses is also an important stuff. So, um, so what, did we do, what, what, what do we do for uh, serverless SQL? First of all, there is a public preview of, uh, of reading the delta tables that exist in lake databases create, created using Spark by serverless SQL. So now when you, when you create your delta tables using 
Spark, you, you run you optimize with the order and everything, then server SQL is good to go and you can right away query the data. The second thing is related to um, how you how you de develop and deliver your projects with server SQL. So now we support uh, duck pack, I would say, so support for Visual Studio. I'm not convinced if all the features listed on the slides uh, are here, but it, that's the direction. So schema comparison, if, not, if it's not yet available, it should come sooner or later, rather sooner than later. So right now you can, you can uh, base your deployments on the uh, database projects in, uh, in Visual Studio. That's basically using the SQL package with the extract and the yeah. publish. Um, there's a video on the Synapse YouTube channel as well on this, uh, showing you how to do it. You're great marketing. Man. Yes, I am. Thank you. OK, um, moving to uh, delegated SQL, because Stan is typically presenting lots of uh, serverless. So this time we decided to give it a go and maybe do some uh, presentation on dedicated, not to leave this behind. So for dedicated SQL, we, first of all, we got a public preview of multi-column distribution, long awaited and requested by many customers. So now you can, uh, you can uh, build your hashing distribution based on not just one column, but several of them, uh, which helps a lot because that may, first of all, uh, bring your, bring your uh, data warehouses from on-premises appliances or SQL Server to, to uh, dedicated SQL pool more easily than, than it used to be. And second, it basically improves the, the performance. I think we can elaborate about it using you. Stan GPT, please. Here is a demo, Powell, on multi-column distribution in Azure Synapse dedicated SQL pools. Now, who has ever used uh, dedicated SQL pools? A few. So, what are the three types of distribution that we have? Two stickers. Ash, Two stickers. Hash, round robin, replicate. First one here, Adam. Mm -hmm. those so, those those indeed, hash, round robin, replicate. What makes dedicated SQL pools queries not perform well? Like there's some sort of internal move that we do, yes? Shuffle move, yeah. So shuffle move is basically when you, it's not a sticker over there, sorry. <laughs> I've got my marketing guy I'm with not me. Sure who's, I'm not sure who's the, who's, who's the AI robot here, thank you. So shuffle moves, and shuffle moves usually come by when you have, you've got all these distributions, and your data is distributed across these nodes. And you only have one distribution key you can choose previously, which means that you only have one key. Which meant, meant like if you had sales, uh, let's say your business key was two columns, you had to concatenate that column and then actually join on that concatenated column because you were not able to do it on that one on those two columns at the same time. Now, that has changed. If you would like to use a preview, so public preview, you go to your dedicated SQL pool and you execute this specific, oh, this specific command. So alter database code configuration set compatibility level to 9,000. It's over 9,000, sorry. <laughs> so uh, compatibility level 9,000. If you set it back to auto, it's disabled again. But also the tables that you've created with multi-column distribution will not work anymore, okay? Now, how do you create it? Very easy, just enable this and then you say distribution, Hash, pick up date, drop up date, and it works. So you can create multi-column distribution. Now there's a very cool side effect about this. Just by enabling that compatibility level higher, what you enable also, because you have multi-column distribution, there's a new concept called multi-column shuffle. Which means normally you would have a shuffle move for every shuffle that you needed to do. Now multi-column shuffle is going to combine those shuffles and only do one or two shuffles, while otherwise you would do five or six shuffles. This greatly enhances the performance of your dedicated SQL pools. If you just like enable the feature, you see your load going down like 30, 40 percent just by enabling it because you've got that multi-column shuffle. Okay. Thank you, Stan. I'm very, 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 very excited about this feature. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. Back to Paul. Let's, let's go back. Uh, so, hey, you may start complaining. Oh, we we had those three types of distributions. Now we have three and a half because. <laughs> Because you have to decide which columns, uh, not just one, but plenty of them. So how to actually maybe deal with this problem? Well, we have new stuff for you, distribution advisor. Uh, please spot the link at the bottom of this slide, aka.ms slash synapse toolbox. It's pretty much useful. It's not just about distribution advisor. It, 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 it takes more, more tools. But this distribution advisor, what it can do for you? 
It can take your queries, either from the query history or queries provided by you, and it can analyze those queries, and based on the, based on the workload, it can produce uh, suggestions about how you should, uh, how you should um, distribute your tables, which is basically great, great advisory. So make sure you take a look at that. And, Not yet uh, for the multi-column, yeah. though. Only for the single yes. column? Yes. Yes. So the, I mean, the, this this will come, right? So we we decided to go first with uh, uh, getting getting closer to GA with uh, MCD, and then um, the toolbox will also be aligned to MCD. The toolbox as well. Huh? The toolbox. Toolbox. Yeah. Have you looked at Azure Synapse toolbox? Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I, I'll have right on that. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Uh, short on memory. Yeah. <laughs> GPT, okay. I, have, I wasn't we trained have to, on that. We have to update, <laughs> update the, fir the firmware. <laughs> okay, data science. Uh, none, of, none of us is data scientists, but hey, nowadays with Synapse, you don't have to be actually a machine learning expert to run some pretty fancy, pretty fancy AI stuff. So the direction here, I'd say there are a couple of directions. First of all, we want to make sure that we support the latest improvements in uh, AI and machine learning. So open AI, for sure, it's loud enough, that's why we, we use uh, Stan GPT for the, for, for the purpose of demos. Pretty cool. Uh, second thing is uh, make sure that uh, we support open source frameworks like MLflow. Another one is that uh, we want to make sure that you can play quite easily with existing APIs and that this, this experimenting is not expensive. So. I'm not sure how much of you is aware, but we have something called Synapse ML. AKA.ms slash Spark is a great example of how our developers make things easier for end user and, uh, and data engineer to play with AI. Basically, what it's all about, it's a library or, or let's say a set of tools for Synapse notebooks that, that you can use to make just a couple of lines to access any AI, any AI API we have, so starting from cognitive services and ending up with even Azure OpenAI service is great for this, for this purpose. Now, with uh, version 0 0.10, we also introduce MLflow support and been there where you can experiment without spinning up clusters. So that's actually pretty cool. So what, uh, what Stan GPT will show you will be actually related pretty much with his brain, with his brain inside. So GPT, then GPT proceed and show us how we can integrate Synapse with OpenAI. Thank you, Pavel. I will show you a demo on how to integrate GPT-3 OpenAI with Azure Synapse Spark, my brother. There we go. So um, uh, let's think about a few use cases. Why and how could you use, like the new buzzwords, prompt engineering. You've heard prompt engineering, right? Like, hey, you just have to know how to write good prompts and it will solve a lot of your issues. So I'm doing something similar. So I was thinking, like, what can I do with GPT that would make my life more easy? So if I get a requirements documentation by each column, what it needs to look like, and I can do that data cleaning just by putting the sentence in that they said to me what it needs to be, and it gives me back the column, that would be awesome. So is that possible? Yes, it is. So a few things that you need. I'll, I'll first head over to this thing here. I've got uh, create functions. So I'm going to create functions, and those functions are going to create prompts for me. So I will always use a prompt, because OpenAI is just like, hey, show me this, do this, do this action. The more clear you are in when you're prompt, the better results you're going to get. If you've played with Tally or with anything like that, you see like sometimes your artwork's really, really off, but the more details you get, the better and better it gets. Same thing with this. Now, if we head over to those functions, you can see here, I have a few data quality checks that I'm going to execute. For example, I am going to convert a date to the right format. Uh, I'm going to... Um, convert the time to the right format. I'm going to create a JSON um, with uh, zip code, city name, um, street name, street number. And I'm going to convert the country name to a uh, standard alpha code. OK, so usual stuff that we need to do and write a lot of code for. Now, if I load, load this, you can see over here, I have loaded this, imported those functions, blah, blah, blah. Boom, we're ready to go. Now. One thing you need is an OpenAI um, framework, uh, so the OpenAI service. If you want to start using this, 
apply now because it takes about two, three weeks for you to get an application and then you can start creating those resources. So apply now, okay? Now, um, then of course, uh, key vaults to uh, link all those things to it to make sure you are accessing it in a secure way. Also, it's using cognitive services, so it also has private VNet integration. So no, it's not going through the internet. It's using the model on the backbone of Microsoft. Now, I'm uh, actually, one of the more harder types of data is written data, and I've got some insurance claims coming in. And it's been written data, and it's really hard to analyze that specific type of data. So what I'm going to show you here is I have a list of insurance claims, and you can see here, by the way, created by GPT, um, an insurance address in all these multiple languages, the country as well, like with different singles in there, here Polska with a dot in there, like very, very poor quality of data, which would take a lot of time to actually make it better. Same with the dates, all different formats. Mm, Polska, thank, thank you. you. Yes, and all these different times as well. Now, I just wanna say, convert that time. That's, I, I don't care, just do it. And just do it following these specific rules that I specified in those functions. So what we're going to do then, is we're going to create a prompt. So a prompt, which is basically here, prompt UDF. And I'm going to say, use this column, and then I'm going to alias that. So I'm doing that for every function that I'm doing for all those fields, okay? And I'll display that. You see it creates those prompts. So um, from this insurance address, you see like extract zip code, street name, blah, 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 blah. So I create all those prompts for it. So I'm not actually executing one prompt, I'm executing a prompt for everything that I have in my data frame. Now, scrolling down, now I actually have to call this. And how do you call this? You say over here, um, you get the ML cognitive and import OpenAI completion. And then you say uh, OpenAI completion and then set subscription key and a lot of these things. There's a blog online if you want to try this out yourself. Um, but basically it says like, get this, give me the prompt address. So the column that I'm going to analyze where my prompt is in, give me an error column if something goes wrong and a response address, which is going to be my output, my, my formatted address in JSON format. So if I run this, <clears throat> you can see over here, so I've done this transform, eh? execute that thing now, and now you can see over here that uh, instead of, um, you've got those prompt address, the extant countries, and everything is ready to go. And then over here, I have executed this, and now you can see that, for example, Czech Republic is CZ, uh, Polska is PL, the dates have been converted correctly, the uh, address has been converted into a JSON object. While otherwise it would take me lots of code, now I'm just prompting this. It is still not very, very scalable yet, but it's getting better and better and better. But this is a new tool that you have in your toolbox. Like when you need to do data quality, even well, another video we've done is creating test data. It's one of the hardest things to do to get very good test data based upon your data frames. You can just load in your data frames without any data, just a structure, and say, like, build me a relational model and data that makes sense using that GPT. That is a bit more code, but it does work. So that was the demo by my brother. Thank you very much. So uh, if you are looking for more examples on uh, Synapse integration of GPT-3, uh, make sure you watch the latest videos uh, from uh, Stan GPT and uh, Thomas. Yes. Uh, there's more coming because uh, we as actually have uh, also Synapse ML team uh, creating videos on that, so uh, expect us to cover GPT pretty pretty extensively. Uh, so with that, let's move smoothly to the uh, observational analytics uh, area. So it's actually it's about a Data Explorer engine or Custo, as you might know. Somebody somebody of you attended yesterday's session on Custo, yeah. So you probably know what it is. So it's great for log telemetry analytics, some real-time scenarios. Basically, whenever you have append-only data with large volumes and high frequency of data, JSON structures from APIs, it's great for interactive queries. In, so, in milliseconds, you can analyze terabytes of free text and, and JSON files. So uh, the directions here, lots of, lots of features, first of, first of all. Uh, this team is never, sleep, never sleeps. Um, so, Whatever, whatever, so whatever comes to uh, in data ingestion, improvements in terms of, thank you very much, uh, improvements in terms of uh, which data you can ingest from which data sources, including AWS S3 recently, um, the number of files that you can, uh, that you can ingest from directly from your laptop uh, has increased uh, recently as well, 
But uh, I think the major direction is making, uh, making this beast, as I call it, even more powerful by providing new uh, KQL function. KQL, KQL is a language used for analytics with uh, Data Explorer. I would say it, at some at some times uh, KQL can be even more powerful than T-SQL in SQL Server. I love T-SQL and I was you know for all my life thinking with T-SQL. At some point it turned also to uh, be poisoned, poisoned by ducks, but uh, I know how it is. Um, so hey. Uh, we have a, one example of great improvement uh, for KQL for you. This is scan function. I'm super excited about it because it's actually bringing process mining to KQL. So what you can do with a scan function, you can use it to uh, scan the data that you have in large data set, build sequences based on uh, some predicates that you, that you define step by step. It doesn't have to be just one step. And then use it for any, any, anything in your queries. So you imagine scenarios, for example, logistics. In logistics, one of the biggest challenges is to build the sequence of statuses or even define how those statuses may go from one to another. So with that, it's quite easy. I will show you maybe not that much business case, but it's, maybe, it, 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 it's, it's quite, uh, I would say, oh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite significant. So stand GPT. <clears throat> Server is too busy right now. Server is too busy right now. Uh, Cannot process requests. With, with, with this build, it happened a lot. Sorry, apologies. Um, yeah, crowd is a state of uh, never-ending failure. Sorry, uh, I have to proceed my own, on my own. Uh, okay. Fortunately, I have a recording of this demo. So hey, here I'm having stock data of Microsoft. Hey, the best stock you can buy. I'm showing you some of the data. Spot this column adjusted close. So that's the number I'm going to, I'm going to analyze. So it's a, it's a closing, closing stock price at the end of the day. And I'm, I'm running scan for detecting uh, the, most, the, 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 longest, the longest period when the price was increasing every, every single day after another. Uh, the, the, I mean, the statement doesn't look like the simplest one. But imagine building this kind of statement in, in, in T-SQL purely. So it's just one function with two steps defined, how you correlate uh, corresponding rows. And then it actually adds the subquery that I built, it adds the sequence number for every single sequence when the, when the price was increasing day after day. And then the only thing is to, fi the only thing is to find the ID with the, the most rows, as simple as that. So, you can build pretty much uh, sophisticated process mining analytics using this function. Um, and when I execute uh, the whole statement, you will just see the result. The big part, the big, the big thing about KQL, as I think of it, is that the flow of the query is natural. So think about running the query, starting from selecting a table, projecting columns, uh, filtering by any, any columns, aggregating, running sophisticated things like scan, and then uh, even drawing a time chart, time chart, time chart uh, on the screen. So it's not just about tables. Thank you, Stan GPT, for not supporting me with this demo. Um, uh, support ticket open. <laughs> okay. Um, hey, BI. We are not Power BI people. I mean, I'm probably a bit of Power BI person, but um, just a bit. So we will not have a demo on Power BI. Uh, just. Uh, uh, I have the last duty, duty at the booth of Synapse Analytics with Patrick LeBlanc. That may, be, that may be a good idea to drop in and ask Patrick tough questions about Power BI. So, uh, but this topic is very much related to Synapse because Synapse, uh, Synapse and Power BI work together, um, I would say even closely than ever. So what you see about uh, enterprise investments in Power BI is the, this, first of all, if if it comes to making uh, some optimizations, whenever you go towards direct mode models, that, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the direction of improvement. So you see, for example, horizontal fusion, uh, that's, that's one of the features. Another one, making Power BI models even more scalable than they are right now. Power BI premium users. OK, that's it, thank you. So hey. Uh, this is, uh, there is one feature that you might be interested in, query scale out, uh, or sorry, data set scale out. So you can use it for uh, making sure that the, 
you know, the Power BI data sets work, work smoothly with increasing number of users. Hey, but uh, two features I wanna, I wanna highlight is this. Horizontal fusion, it's about making sure that if you switch to direct query mode, the number of queries that come from your, from your visuals is kept at minimum. Uh, historically, it, it, it was and it still is a big problem whenever you wanna go with direct query that every single Power BI visual sends at least one query. Typically, it's not one query, right? So you, you can quickly deplete uh, your slots when it comes to dedicated SQL pool, or you can kill practically any database with you know high amount of queries. And I see Power BI developers just dragging and dropping lots of visuals on the screen. Actually, if there wasn't even historically a request that we should maybe uh, uh, provide an option to, to, to limit the number of visuals on the screen, but uh, it's not gonna happen probably. <laughs> we wanna make sure that you're free to go. Um, uh, see, uh, see, rather, rather expect us to provide some additional improvements for visuals uh, than limiting the number of visuals. But this is a great feature. We should enable that in uh, preview features in uh, Power BI Desktop to, ch to check how this minimizes the number of queries. Second feature is also about desktop. Ah, sorry, this is about desktop. The previous one is more about service. So the, in desktop, you will see optimized ribbon. Why it's cool? Because now you can, when you have data set that is uh, based on direct query mode, you can pause your whole report and un unpause a single visual to check how much queries and what kind of queries are running to the backend system, Synapse, for example. So it's great whenever you have direct query mode. It actually, you should check it out. Okay, um, so with that, let me wrap it up. You saw investments of Microsoft in Synapse, and not just Synapse actually, in several work, workspaces and areas. Keep in mind, this will be the direction. The, the, overall, the, the overall direction, we wanna make sure that those two work together smoothly, and that's that direction in general. Call to action for you. Make a photo of this QR code or just, just uh, point on it to go to uh, aka.ms Synapse Community Resources, that's the number one place where you should go for grabbing this slide. It's, it's, it's basically this slide. It collects all the major links that we want, you to, we want you to use to learn Synapse, to practice, and you know, master at some point. Uh, because I have Stan GPT, I have to uh, refer to Synapse YouTube channel, so make sure you, you join the subscriber, uh, the subscriber membership there. Mm -hmm. and watch all the videos that Stan and the, the Synapse Espresso team is recording on multiple aspects of Synapse. Uh, recently, mostly on GPT, that's why we decided to go with GPT Stan, Stan GPT. Uh, but it's also, uh, it also covers uh, lots, of, lots of basic stuff, so you can find lots of learning resources there as well. Um, so we'll take questions before, before you can vote. Let's say, let's answer the first question from the online participants. Uh, are there global parameters in uh, Synapse Analytics? The answer is no, and I have no time for arrival of this feature to Synapse, unfortunately. So when, if, if it comes to you know, questions, so should I, should I migrate my data factory to Synapse? The answer is, if you like heavily on global parameters, either you, you find some workaround or, or the answer is no. Okay. You can still have a mix of those two, right? You can spin your Azure Data Factory instances and work with Synapse as a serving layer, for example. Questions? Um, can you have the SAP CDC connector also just working with the copy activity? So the question was, can you have the SAP CDC for the copy data activity, currently only for the data flow? Yes, we started with data flows, um, so yeah, data flows. Um, Good question. <laughs> I expect it. Are there any limitations to the merge statement? Can you repeat? Yeah. Uh, are there any limitations to the merge statement with dedicated SQL pool? I know of some uh, limitations that are still there. They're in the documentation. So if you look for the merge statement, it will clearly state like in these few cases, it will not work properly. Uh, if you ever faced any problem in terms of performance on lim or limitations in terms of features or functionality of the statement, Notice that it's GA, so you should use ideas. Dot, uh, aka dot, dot ms slash synapse ideas site and uh, share your ideas on how we can improve. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Hey, if there's no, if there are no questions, then we can just have chit chats or grab your stickers. I have a lot of them. 
And with that, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Stan GPT, for uh, thank you for well for having me. With that, I hope you enjoyed the session. I hope you have a great Saturday at SQL Beats. Thank you very much. Thank you.